Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good, good late afternoon. Welcome to this session. Um, when I walked in, I met my dear old friend Francesca Colombo, and she was saying, oh, I have to shift gears now because I just come from another. And I said, oh, it's easy. It's about money. That's what, you, what OECD knows the best. And then she said, oh, this is why you are here, too. <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> Money makes the world go round, you know, and um, I just was thinking, you know, over the many, many years in my career in the Ministry of Health, in, in a Ministry of Health, you know, you are responsible for so much money, you know. I think, how much is it in Austria altogether? Over 30 billion euros. But this is all tied up money. You're financing the banality of volumes. And when it comes to innovation, then you have to look where the money really is. You also know the friends who are following the European Health Forum for a longer time is that we always made an effort to, to include this, this topic of money and fiscal soundness and budgeting, et cetera, et cetera, because to be frank and honest, I know so many people in the health sector who are really bad when it comes to money, when it comes to budgets, to reallocation, etc., etc. This is not what, and the special medical doctors, I don't want to hurt anyone, but <clears throat> they are extremely bad when it comes to money because they know where the money has to go in their pocket. But in terms of, no. I'm taking it back. <laughs> but anyway, no. But the point I would like to make is, in the health sector, it is so important to understand financing schemes, methods of reallocation. Otherwise, we never can do what uh, is here the topic, find the niches of money which we truly need when it comes to innovation. So I'm happy that the Austrian Ministry of Health together with the observatory is organizing this session. And I also do know that <clears throat> my former colleagues in the ministry are very much behind it because that's what they learned from me, to look after the money and that money makes the world go round. I think it's you now. Okay, have fun. Money is important. Thank you very much. Uh, Clemens, round of applause, please. <laughs> Indeed, and the title of the session is Money Fuels the Health System Moonshots. Our president, Clemens Auer, this morning or this afternoon, early afternoon in the plenary, very clearly illustrated the increasing strains on, on public budgets and the increasing demands, be that because of increased need for health services for the aging population, be that because of costly innovations or the increasing calls for more um, remuneration for our health professionals, as we heard in, in the other session this morning. So it is very clear that this is a really, really important topic to figure out. The other um, takeaway message from the plenary earlier today was that inflation and the general uh, economic situation was one of the main worries of participants at the conference when thinking about the perma crisis. So when we start to think about the financial challenge of providing sustainable funding for our health systems, it is clear that within this context it becomes even more important than it has been so far. So we're very fortunate today um, to have a great uh, team of experts with us in two different panels and different constellations. So we have tried to make an, an active session and we hope that you will also participate actively. Uh, before I introduce our speakers um, for the first part of the session, just to remind everyone the rules of the game. Uh, we have our audience who is here in the Valley. We have our audience who is online. Uh, and for both audiences, we have our Slido. And I believe the hashtag in this room is moon. Right? So if you go to Slido and the hashtag is Moon, that you can join Slido, you can ask your questions or add your comments uh, via Slido. And for those of you who are in the room with us, um, we will also uh, take your points from the floor live. Um, we will ask you to interact with us via Slido, not only via your own questions, but also via some, of que some questions and prompts that we have prepared. 
So if you want now, while I'm talking, least important, um, to go to the website um, and already start logging in so that you're ready when we actually ask you to, um, to join with us. So in the first part of the session, we have three very, very distinguished speakers, as you can see, and I will invite them to join me uh, up on stage. We have Director Berger from the European Commission's uh, DG Reform. We have Francesca Colombo from the OECD, and we have Tamás Evetovic from the WHO Barcelona Office on Health Systems Financing. So for the three of you, please join me. And we are going to discuss, yes, great. Thank you, Hervik, for initiating. <laughs> Just because maybe one more to the right. Thank you. So in this in this first part, we're going to discuss how we make best use of the options that we have for sustainable funding and for actually supporting our health systems um, towards uh, strengthening and transformation. Um, and we're also going to discuss the difficulties of making the case for health system investment when we are talking about public budgets that are already strained to the limits, as we have already heard. And we're also going to discuss what we should and should not consider and the dangers of different options. So to start, I would like to pass the microphone to Director Berger to give us um, an overview of her thoughts and DG Reform's initiatives when it comes to this question. Is money fueling the health system moonshot? Is that the most important element? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. Your question is, is it the most important? Or is it important? Or is it one of the elements that matter? So um, in DG reform, uh, we, have, we are providing support to member states to drive forward important reforms at the initiative of the member states. Um, in the context of the post-COVID recovery, the European Union, the European Commission, is actually fueling a lot of money, a major pot of money. Uh, I think the equivalent of more than 2 trillion euros to the member states uh, to finance reforms and investments. We have borrowed more than 754 billion euros uh, to uh, support the National Recovery and Resilience Plan. And of course, in the context of the National Recovery and Resilience Plans, there are some measures, some investments which are necessary, some reforms which are absolutely necessary in order to support the health reforms. Now, your question was, is it the most important? So that's why it becomes very, very difficult. What I would like to say is that money is certainly important because we can't drive a reform forward without having the necessary financial resources. But I would dare to affirm that money is only one type of fuel, of carburant, that fuels the health system moonshot. And I would like to focus on other ingredients that make a reform successful. And I would like to list a couple of examples. I'll come back to a great German philosopher, Hegel, and one of the modern figures of modern Western philosophy, who said that nothing great in the world has ever been accomplished without passion. Indeed, health systems are us, the people. Passionate people drive the change. We in the Commission, we in DG Reform, when we support the reform, we involve people in co-designing the solution and the health strategies. For example, in Belgium, Estonia, Croatia, Slovenia. We train the local champions in fraud detection in Slovakia. And they are now driving the transformation by developing, developing artificial intelligence-based algorithms to detect fraud and teaching others how to use them. Second, in the successful implementation of the reform, one has to take into account the cultural and the political content, context. So we work with the national experts that speak the national language 
and international experts that bring in an objective, fresh and unbiased approach. So concretely, we know that different needs can be addressed at different levels. For instance, mental health is typically more effective when managed locally. Since many mental health determinants are strictly speaking context specific. On the other hand of the spectrum, we all have painfully realized that the viruses do not stop at borders. Highly communicable diseases can only be tackled at international level, so we have to cater for the right scale of action. Another example is on health system performance assessment that we have been supporting in several member states. This is setting up a framework for assessing the performance of the health system, and we're doing this in Croatia, Czechia, Estonia, Ireland, Latvia, Lithuania, and Slovenia. So concretely, we help defining indicators and domains of assessment together with processes of data gathering, analysis and reporting, and a governance system for the framework to operate in a sustainable manner. And with all of them, we work at national level, since the very purpose of the action is to build knowledge at national level. So it is very important to show, that, to show the reform champions that they are not alone and to support them, for example, through establishing and developing communities of practices. And an interesting point about the latter example is that we have put all these countries in contact with one another, creating a community of practice. And despite the differences between the national health systems, all countries noted great benefits in sharing good and possibly bad experiences as well, and learning from each other. So we organize frequent exchanges of experiences between projects and join meetings with national authorities in all involved countries to share the views on real life cases and look jointly for solutions. And last but not least, we should not or never underestimate the importance of raising the awareness of the ongoing health system transformations with inclusive communication strategies. We are supporting Slovakia, for example, with the design and the implementation of the comprehensive healthcare reform of the primary care and hospital networks. And we have engaged with a professional public relations company to design the communication campaign with citizens, with doctors, nurses, and healthcare officials for the citizens, the doctors, the nurses, and the care officials. So since the title of our session is on the financial challenges of developing innovative health systems, I would like to end this uh, um, introduction by an innovative approach that will be later on presented by three member states, Austria, Belgium, and Slovenia. In the light of the Commission priorities on advancing the health union and increasing the resilience of the European health systems, the resources hub for sustainable investments in health is one of the most important work streams that the European Commission DG reform kick-started this year. This health hub has a great potential for replicability even beyond the remit of the health area. The health hub will enable the member states and project promoters in the member states to navigate through the various programs that the European Union offers and through the various funding instruments in order to identify how they could best make use of this support provided by the European Union. It will also provide networking, knowledge sharing and guidance to build the capacity of the public authorities for reform design and implementation and project promoters for the planning 
the development and implementation of large-scale health system transformation projects. And you will hear more about this during today's panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. I think uh, a very comprehensive presentation and very in line with the topic of the conference as a whole, the moonshot for a real European health union. And I think we will see, uh, as you already have described uh, really, really aptly, the different ways uh, that, the, that the Commission can help. Uh, I would like to uh, open and comment a bit further while we engage with our audience um, to open our first um, Slido poll for our audience members. Um, and ask you to type in um, what is the most important ingredient to fuel the health system moonshot. Keep in mind the title of the session, but also keep in mind uh, what you just heard uh, from Natalie about the other important ingredients. And while we do that, the one thing that I would like to, to reflect on, because it, it, it struck me while you were describing the ways, the different ways um, that you can help that are not directly related to providing additional funding, is that a lot of them had to do with making better use of the resources in the system. Uh, so for example, in helping with payment mechanisms, understanding payment mechanisms, or even combating fraud, that really means not losing an amount of your resources. So even if it's not directly increasing funding externally, it really has to do uh, with ensuring that the, the resources that are within the system um, are used in, a, in an optimal way. So I think this is an, an important point to make. We see already um, some slider results. Political will, the most important ingredient to fuel the health system moonshot. Um, it, it seems that at the current juncture, and as we heard from earlier sessions today, this will exists at the European and at the national level. And I think reflecting back to what Natalie was saying, if member states reach out to the Commission, there is a lot that the Commission can do, but there has to be that, uh, that commitment also on the side of the member states to actually reach out and ask. Um, so I think we see money. Yes, you are in the right session. Thank you for joining us. Accountability. Um, and for that, um, I have to say, I'm, it brings me back to a, a policy brief that colleagues at the Observatory produced in 2018 about making the case uh, for investing in health systems and how one of the most important ingredients is that health policy makers have to demonstrate that the investments in the health systems are actually value for money and they are used in a transparent and accountable way. So I think this is quite important that it's here. Leadership and courage, yes, especially in the current context. So I think money and political will seem to be the two front runners. I, I think Slido doesn't automatically make money red because that's the topic of the session. I think it has to do with how important people think it is. But we also see um, a lot uh, of different uh, ingredients that reflect well uh, what Natalie was talking about, knowledge, um, priority setting, ingenuity, passion, is that what we heard? So I think quite a rich cloud here, uh, and that shows us also that our job is not an easy one, but I think a lot of what we see uh, is reflected in the number of people that we have here with different backgrounds and the different types of contributions that we've, that we've heard so far and will continue to, to listen to. So I think we, we, uh, we have something to take away from the Slido and for those of you who took pictures of it, I will be asking you to, to share them with me afterwards. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome our second speaker, Francesca Colombo. Uh, Francesca, on the money side of things, yeah. as Clemens introduced, uh, this is your, your daily work. Um, so the, uh, the OECD has been working in that area for a, for a long time, and in particular um, in, the, in the public funding and how that is um, used. You have your joint network where health po policymakers and financial ministers come together to discuss. So why don't you uh, give us your thoughts on sure. the session? My, my thought, and I, I start with the political will for money. <laughs> I think we need to have a very, very honest conversation that is going to be incredibly difficult, that political will. And, uh, you know, let me just work through some of the arguments, and I think we just need to, to keep on working from on that, because the, the, the trail ahead is going to be very, very hard. The situation is going to be tight, we know, the money will become even tighter. In a context in which we know that the demands are higher, and the pandemic has shown a huge need for further investment. So if we look at the very short term, there have been in, in, huge injections 
in the health system during the course of the pandemic to sustain, you know, in a, almost like in a panic mood in, a, in some ways. But that has managed at least to minimize some of the worst possible outcomes on, uh, on, on people. If we look at the very uh, short-term also projections on, on, on spending, we see that, that money will continue to remain quite high in terms of increases. Uh, for uh, this year, for example, and, uh, and for us here, relative to what used to be before the, the pandemic. If we look at the medium term, there is a huge need for further investment to make a uh, health system more resilient. And I stress this health system more resilient because this is a broader concept than investment in pandemic preparedness and response. There is a huge amount of discussions, those of you who are familiar with the G20 uh, discussions which are going on about, uh, you know, uh, making sure that there is enough new injections of money for pandemic preparedness and response. But that's a very, very minuscule part of what is needed to make health system more resilient. We have made some heroic estimates at OECD looking at the current level of investments in different parts of the health system, looking at where there were the most problems and therefore trying to estimate what would be the type of investment needed to bring the countries which are at the lowest level of spending to levels more compatible with the resilient health system. We came up with a figure in the order of 1.4% of GDP. So basically saying now to Minister of Finance, inject 1.4% of GDP on average across OECD countries more in health systems. Uh, we think it's really needed. It's targeted investments in things like workforce, uh, information system, um, you know, issues like prevention, so things that we have been saying for so much time. Um, it's absolutely necessary. But the question will be where to find the money. And in the longer term, we know, you know, the driver of, uh, you know, link to aging, uh, you know, technology, um, expectations from populations, those are, are, are there. And some of the projections that we have point to, increase of health spending going way beyond 11% um, uh, of, uh, of GDP. So the question is, how do we find that money? And it's not an indifferent question. It was already difficult when the pandemic struck, but now we are in a context of multiple crises. Uh, we have Ukraine, we have the war, we have uh, inflation, we have uh, uh, food prices uh, issues, energy prices. So in the very short term, there is a question of who will absorb some of those uh, pressure on price increases. Is it going to be governments? Is it going to be um, households? Is it going to be providers? Uh, is it going to be who? You know, not an easy uh, question. And I hear also that in some countries already, they are saying, well, health already got quite a lot of money uh, through the pandemic. Now, you know, we need to redirect resources somewhere else. If we look at the longer uh, term, there is a real question about how do we allocate resources. And there are probably, uh, you know, different options that we can think of. And I don't have the magic uh, uh, answer to that. And probably that will require discussion um, within each, each country. But first of all, you can say, well, we want to increase the overall pot of money available for governments. So tax reforms in some countries critically needed. There are not efficient system for raising revenues uh, in terms of uh, tax system. So that's uh, absolutely fundamental. Um, but if you ask, uh, you know, countries and populations whether they're willing to have higher taxes, well, you know, um, uh, mixed views. So if you ask in absolute terms, are you willing to have more funding going to health? We have done a survey uh, at OECD, which, uh, which looks uh, really at preferences for people for, uh, for investing, and uh, um, health came as uh, number one or, or two, together more with social uh, investments. But if you ask them, are you willing to, to have more money directed to health, but this will require higher contributions or higher taxes, the willingness actually reduces. So, so you know, that's one option. The other option is to say, we reallocate resources away from other parts of uh, you know, government budgets into health. It's probably in some countries very much needed. Uh, some of the Eastern, more Eastern European countries probably still a, a small share of uh, uh, the total uh, government spending goes to health. On average across OECD countries, we are already at 15%. And with those investments of 1.4% uh, of GDP, which I mentioned, we'll get to 20% of government budgets going to health. Personally, I think it's great. I mean, that's what we should do. But, you know, it's not an easy conversation uh, uh, to have. Uh, the, obviously, the, the third uh, issue is, uh, you know, making uh, better use of resources or so tackling waste that is still quite uh, widespread in, uh, in health system. 
and very much improving those budgeting uh, practices. So, you know, the, the uh, dialogue between health and finance, but really make, making sure that uh, we think more on a uh, long uh, term, so we have a, a multi-year uh, budgeting uh, system that take into account of uh, those investments which are needed in health systems, so require a time frame which goes beyond uh, the recurrent expenditure in, uh, uh, in one year. But also issues uh, about uh, improving the way we, uh, we have uh, the budget negotiation and having more transparency in the budget negotiations. What are the parameters that go into those budget negotiations? How to align to good practice in terms of financial management uh, uh, principles uh, as well? You know, so beyond health, obviously that's more of a public spending um, and having good principle of public spending is it's important. Effective budget execution is also quite important in some countries. Even if there is more money going there, the issues become of how to effectively spend that, that money in a way that is also monitored. So having, you know, in, uh, during the year monitoring of how the, the budget is uh, executed. And uh, linked to that also issues like uh, uh, spending uh, uh, reviews, you know, making sure that we understand where the budget is, is uh, going, where the money is going, and whether this is going really to those investments which are critically needed to a more um, uh, performing, better performing uh, and resilient health system. So I'll finish there. Those are some of the options. I cannot say, you know, go for probably there is a mix of all of them which is, which is needed, but I think the conversation will continue. We hear already from countries that they're struggling. They're struggling in, you know, uh, even with all that we have seen through the pandemic, where they are struggling to make the case for further money going to health. Uh, so we need to come with a bit of, uh, uh, you know, open mindedness and knowing that is not going to be an easy ride. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca, and I think that echoes uh, well what we, what we heard earlier today. That was a very rich seven minutes, I think, of a lot of different uh, dimensions that you brought. Um, I, I, I want to uh, uh, two things. One is to uh, reflect on what she said about health already having had its day in a way that, that, we, that we hear, and at the same time, uh, we know that there was a lot of increased spending because of COVID, but it wasn't necessarily always going into the health systems in a way that ensured that they were strengthened towards becoming resilient. And I think that was one of the main motivations for the session today, to try and think of that a bit, a bit more in depth. We come back to that topic. We have our second um, Slido interaction with our audience. Here is a disclaimer. When we put these questions together, we didn't know what Francesca was going to talk about. Um, so it's, um, it's quite interesting. Uh, yes, exactly. So what do you think, and that's now coming to you, um, is the best way to invest in innovative public health systems in a sustainable way? not public health systems, public health systems, by optimizing allocation within existing health budgets, by increasing private spending, e.g. shifting costs to patients, by increasing revenues from public budgets, or none of these options. I give you a minute uh, to take stock of all of that, think about where you stand based on what we heard already uh, and what you think is right. Um, as Francesca said, it's probably going to be a, well, not a combination of all of those, hopefully, but a combination of some of those um, and other uh, approaches. And we were going to hear from Tamash in, in a minute what other innovative approaches we might have, not quite yet. So we have, by optimizing allocation within existing health budgets, winning. We already have 60 people who have voted. This is already great. Um, Yes, by increasing private spending, e.g. shifting costs to patients, deservedly has 0%, which is already really encouraging. None of these options has 10. Uh, so what I would like to ask those of you who answered this is to use the Slido option of Q&A to give us what your option is uh, if it's none. Neither optimizing allocation within existing health budgets and increasing revenues from public budgets. So if it is increasing the public budget as a whole, uh, with increasing taxation, for example, we reflect on what um, Francesca has been talking about. But this is already uh, showing us that you know we, we may ask for um, sustained, increased investment in health systems, but we have also to not forget that we need to work with what we have in the best possible way. And I think that goes well with Natalie's presentation um, as well, uh, with the examples of uh, DG reform action uh, and with a range of tools that, that the EU has. Okay. 
So we also see about 39%, 40% increasing revenues from public budgets, and that's going to be a, a, a tough sell, even though uh, we have the experience of the pandemic, because we have all these other tensions, as we've been talking about. Nicole Maurer, uh, my colleague from the observatory, is in our newsroom. Very briefly, Nicole, we see people voting. Do we have also lots of questions and comments? And especially, do we have comments about what the none of these options, other options are? So yeah, the discussion is starting to, to warm up. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the audience is very engaged with this topic. The first question that we received was how much money, uh, which I thought was funny. Um, but jokes aside, no, um, the discussion is, is going on about uh, what the importance of investment is at national level. Uh, so should we focus on, on the country level? Should we focus on, on European infrastructures? But also some people are suggesting that governance is more important. Should we remove bureaucratic um, barriers? And, and that's basically what, what people are discussing at the moment. We also have some, some questions for our speakers already, but I think I will keep those Not yet. for later. Yes. yes. <laughs> because we still have to hear from Tamash, and maybe he answers all the questions already. So Tamash, we come to you. Um, innovative financing for health systems. Innovative financing for innovative health systems. Give us your thoughts. Thank you, Dimi. It's great to see the results. Let me stand because I want to so show some slides. Sorry, this is in my job description. I always have to show this first slide. Um, but that's not the only slide I'm going to have. I think it's great to see this answer because it shows that the, the audience put practically efficiency on top of the agenda. So, you know, when it comes to the discussion with the finance ministry, you know, finally we can show that a health, a primarily health, uh, officials, uh, audience voted for efficiency that within the existing budget. However, I would like to take it from where Francesca left. And I think, and it's, it's very important. She uh, explained it uh, more comprehensively. I will pick on one important fiscal sustainability challenge, which is that no politician will run for election on a ticket that promises more taxes, higher taxes, new taxes. Even if it's health tax, they will not promise, at least as part of their campaign. But at the same time, as you mentioned, survey after survey says and suggests that citizens prefer their governments to spend more on health, more public funds on health, at the expense of other sectors. Now, of course, when it comes to the question of you know, which other sectors, that's a bit of a challenge. But still, there is a mismatch between what's successful when you run for election and what the citizens actually expect you to do in government. Talking about innovative financing, if you solve that challenge, I will call it innovative, for sure. Since nobody really defined what innovative means when it comes to financing, I, I, I was, I think, brave enough to come up with three criteria, at least for what I would consider innovative. First of all, we have to go beyond traditional approaches to health financing, and I think this is something obvious to anyone. Bismarck and Beveridge were great innovators at that time. Now we move, need to move forward and going beyond Bismarck, you know, not just relying on health insurance contributions, but general budget transfers for health insurance. I'm looking at Vesna, Slovenia. More general budget transfers for health insurance, mixed revenue sources in health insurance. That goes beyond Bismarck. Moving from linking entitlement to payment of contribution to universal population coverage, regardless of whether they contribute or not. That's definitely a first criteria. Second, increase public spending on health equitably. We have seen increasing public spending on health by taxing the poor more and not the rich. Giving tax cuts to the rich, that's not equitable. So increasing public spending equitably, that's my second criteria. And the third is fill coverage gaps. Now, we will hear a very innovative approach, and Natalie has already mentioned, that goes beyond the traditional thinking of 
how we should finance health. Health should be financed through health budgets. No. All the other sectors can uh, contribute to funding the health system. You will hear more about that later. I will cover a little bit more on the third part, filling coverage gaps. Gaps in coverage come in the form of unmet needs and financial hardship. Luckily, we have the EU producing these EU silk survey data on unmet need every year. We see the poor and the rich, a major gap in terms of unmet need for health care. In some countries, not much, and very low unmet need. In poorer performing countries, a large gap. It's mainly the poor who suffer from unmet need. The same applies to financial hardship. And I would like to focus on that right-hand side of the, of, the, of the slide, because this is new evidence. This is what we contribute at the WHO Barcelona office. This evidence has not existed before. The first time we pre provided this evidence was actually here in Gastein. In 2018, which became one of the most successful sessions together with Stefan. Stefan. And uh, that time it was 24 countries for which we had evidence on catastrophic incidents, one of the indicators of financial protection. And now on this chart you see 36 countries covered. Next year we will have more than 40 countries and we are very uh, lo much looking forward to come back to Gastein organizing another session showing more than 40 countries. There is a very strong correlation between how much out-of-pocket spending is there in a country as a share of total spending and the incidence of catastrophic expenditure by households. And we had this threshold of, or a benchmark of 15%. As you can see, if countries spend less than 15% out of pocket as a share of total spending, the incidence of catastrophic expenditure by households is quite low. So on the left, the well-performing countries. On the right, the poorer performing countries. If you look at which services are responsible for high out-of-pocket expenditure. You can see on the right, the highest is medical products, then dental care, outpatient medicine, 60%, 60%, close to 60%, and 40% on medicines. The other part is public spending. Now, when it comes to what drives financial hardship, interestingly, or not, it's medicines. So on this chart, what you see on the left, the well-performing countries with very low incidence of catastrophic expenditure. On the right, the weaker financial protection, poorer performing countries with very high incidence of catastrophic expenditure. And now here is the breakdown of the services that are responsible for that level of catastrophic incidence. On the right, you see the red, which is medicines. In weaker performing countries, it's medicines. In stronger performing countries, it's also both medical products and dental care. Dental care is mainly unmet need in those countries where financial protection is weaker. And also, for whom? And that's where I show the impoverishing effect. And that's where I think the negotiations with health and, and, and finance ministries become more than just health. It's poverty. This is the impact of people having to pay out of pocket. As a result of that, the share of households experiencing impoverishing expenditure is what you see on the orange, and the share of households that are further pushed into poverty is the red part. And I think the shocking message here is the uh, number and the high share of households who are already poor, who don't have the means to cover basic needs, still having to pay out of pocket. So what's not innovative, financing is when you increase spending privately. That's not innovation. This innovation has already been invented. It's called markets. Don't innovate that one. But further examples that are not innovative. More private investment on health with secured return through public funding in the future. I'm not saying that it's not needed. It's just that it's not, in, not innovative. 
public-private partnership, public-private uh, finance initiatives. That's not innovative. More public spending on health for the rich at the expense of the poor. That's not innovation. All countries do that. That's most of our systems are like. And shifting costs to patients. And linking it to many of the discussions about how to cover the high-priced new medicines, the high-priced new technology, the risk is that we may make a decision to cover those for few patients, but how we deal with the fiscal sustainability challenge, we shift cost to other patients by reducing what's covered for what? Medicines, and we use this, the solution of percentage co-payments and all sorts of other instruments that eventually will lead that more impoverishment and financial hardship for the poor. So that's definitely not innovative financing, and I think this is a very important distinction to make. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamás. I think very... Um also perhaps illuminating for, for many, many of us uh, here in the, in the audience and the different uh, breakdown of what drives impoverishment. I guess the, uh, the argument there, as you say, is if you go to the finance minister with this evidence, you can say this is why you should actually uh, invest more because this is not just about health. So this is, this is quite, a, quite a key point uh, to make here, uh, making the case for uh, financial investment in health. We'll hear about that a bit more from colleagues in the second part uh, of the panel. So we heard what not to do. We heard a bit about what to do uh, from Francesca. We heard about what we can do with the European Commission support. Um, what we'd like to do now is have Anka Toma from the European Patient Forum join us um, and give us a reflection, the only chair that's left, um, give us a reflection from her perspective, um, from the patient perspective, about what you've heard. What are the, your reflections about the financial challenges of, of uh, investing in resilient health systems that have the patient in the centre? Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, to join this panel and to talk about money. Um, <laughs> first, I would say that um, a lot of my points were already covered, and it's not only that, but I'd also like to um, say a little, we told you so, because the European Patients Forum has been um, raising some of the financial hardship issues that you uh, identified, Tamash, uh, since about six years ago in, um, in a report that my colleagues, uh, because I'm new, in a report that my colleagues have done in 2016, we also, um, we did raise the issue that um, it's always the most vulnerable who bear the brunt of um, the lack of financing in the healthcare system. There is a copay that, uh, even at that point, went to as high as 20% of, of cost, cost of care. Um, we had 10% of households in some countries or more reporting uh, inability to, to cope with the, with the cost of treatment. Um, so I told you so on one side. Another, another thing that I would comment is that um, indeed in the poll, uh, I personally answered raising the resources available in, in health. Um, of course, because of my background in prevention, I have to pull a plug also for, for tax reform and especially on the commercial deter determinants of health. And of course, the additional benefit of, of um, preventing the preventable is the efficiency of resources because then you have more resources available for, for patients. Um, for existing patients and for uh, the, the diseases that can't be prevented, uh, not as easily anyway. So um, definitely increasing the influx of resources into the system is, uh, is really, really important. 
Um, the third thing that I would comment is that um, equity is really, really important and that um, we don't want or we want to make sure that any health system reform is really centered around protecting the most vulnerable, uh, which are, uh, it tends to be like the multiple whammy of lower income, uh, poor living conditions, uh, more exposure to various um, disease uh, factors. Uh, or existing morbidities or comorbidities. Um, and those patients are the ones that need most protection as well. So we do need to make sure that any health system reform is really catering for the most vulnerable patients uh, out there. Um, and that is something that, again, uh, EPF has been, uh, has been calling for for a long time. And if I can check my notes, if there's something else. Um, yes. Yes. Um, it's important also that because in, um, in our health system in Europe, we aim to achieve universal health, uh, universal health coverage, universal health access. It's important also not to sacrifice quality of health, uh, not to sacrifice affordability, and to, to ensure a broad range of, um, of health and social services. Health does go beyond the health system. Health is cross-sectoral, uh, and uh, indeed multiple sectors can contribute to health. So um, all of this kind of comes together into a holistic uh, way, and you know, when, when we're looking at the health system moonshot, we need to remember what health systems are made for, which is people, and it's not the people who run them, it's the people who are served, that's all the citizens out there, uh, and in particular, the most vulnerable of them, those who are uh, already sick. And I'll stop here with my comments. Thank you very much, Anka, and all, all of those really crucial to remember, I think, when we think about all the different uh, elements that our, our previous speakers highlighted, the notion of protecting the vulnerable and having the patient at the center, I think, is, is really, really key. Um, it's very um, eye-opening, I think, to think about the different options um, that we heard about the options for better uh, distributing our resources within the system. You said you voted for increasing um, the... Uh, Yes, no, that's absolutely fine, but at the same time, for example, we have this discussion about everything is health, other sectors contributing to health, and if we take money away from social services to put it into health, or if we take money away from education to put it into health, are we actually contributing to health, the total health outcome, the end health outcome, or not? So I'm it's not about taking money away, it's about education for health. The education budget can also be used to implement health education, and... Uh, the, uh, I don't know, the environment budget inherently contributes to health. So it's not, it's also a matter of how do we achieve multiple objectives with the same investment. Thank you. So I, I will come to our audience in a second. Before that, I would like to give our speakers on stage the possibility to react uh, to what you heard from Anka and the, and the patient perspective. I see Francesca is already reaching for the microphone, so you can go first. <laughs> okay. Tomasz no, has I mean, been taking could, notes, I'll come to you. I very, very, very much uh, agree on what you said. Obviously, the, the, the patients, I, I would say the populations, it's not just the patients, but also those who are not necessarily patients should be at the center. On the issues uh, of uh, you know, making sure that there is, uh, if you want, the health objectives in the budgets uh, and in the way of functioning also of other ministries and other sectors, that's absolutely true. It's not always straightforward. Uh, you, know, you talk to uh, you know, agricultural industry, which are so important and fundamental for issues related to food, issues related to antimicrobial resistance and so forth. Sometimes they have different objectives in mind, which are not necessarily aligned to health. So, I think, you know, if we go and say it's easy, you just need to make sure that part of your budget should be uh, uh, contributing to health objectives, maybe they're saying, well, we have other objectives. And I think that's conver the conversation needs to be a little bit more sophisticated. It's not 
a given that the objective of, uh, that we have are really aligned with that of other parts of, uh, uh, of government. Uh, not to say that obviously this is not important, it's just that obviously we need to ourselves probably you know, be a little bit more proactive and go and try to understand also what are the things that motivate the budget investments of other parts of governments and how to make sure that there is alignment. Um, in some cases, there is not. It needs to be uh, you know, worked out, but not to expect that for them it's a given and it's easy that, uh, you know, that they will just uh, allocate the resources in a way that's conducive to improving uh, in health. Yeah. So it's a tough conversation again to, to have. It is a tough conversation. Natalie grabbed the microphone already, so Tamash, you're going to be last. <laughs> Natalie. Thank you. Well, Listening to uh, all the speakers, I was thinking of different aspects of this uh, multifaceted challenge. When we're talking about financing and we're talking about the public finance, mm -hmm. there's of, of course the issue of uh, the right use and the right management of the finances. So you first have the issue of the resource for the state, so taxation and whether you want to indeed raise more tax and public money or whether you want to improve the way that tax are being spent, are being, are being used. And I was thinking of uh, the projects that we are conducting with our technical support instrument to support spending reviews in a number of member states and spending reviews uh, notably in relation with the National Recovery and Resilience Plans. Then I was thinking of Tamash intervention, which was extremely interesting, um, but I may come with a slightly provocative issue question because you had a fantastic presentation which ended on what is actually not an innovative way of funding a health system and then I was looking for the next slide <laughs> what is an innovative way of uh, funding the health system but I'm, I'm sure that you already have some some ideas on this um, there are many, I guess, there are many avenues that could be explored, but from our point of view and from the point of view of DG reform, I think that, and as I started on this, I mean, money is important, but there's something that is more important. And I think what is more important is that the leverage that one can have, the spillover effect um, that one can build if money is well invested. So if money is invested in those determinants that are going to have a bearing on the functioning of the health systems. And that's why we come in support to um, the health reforms of a number of member states. Uh, and when I'm talking about health reform, I'm even thinking of something further, you know, looking at the, the COVID crisis, the, the climate crisis, I mean, the impact on the mental health of the younger people. I'm thinking of the greening of the hospitals. Uh, we have a very important project going on uh, in, in Austria on, on this one. Um, the, the care that is to be provided to the younger and the older generations. We have the European Care Strategy that was adopted on the 7th of September, and which refers to our flagship of uh, DG reform on person-centered care. So there is the issue of the money, indeed, but I would say there is the issue of how we use the money for money to have the maximum multiplying effect. And I'll be looking forward to Tamash's uh, solution on the innovative in a, finance. In a second. And if member states want to ans answer to this question, they can come to DG Reform and ask for help, right? So this is a key takeaway message. Tamash, over to you. Thank you. I was going to say something else, but uh, of course I'm going to respond to this call, which is, is lovely. This is how I started, actually, what is innovative. And instead of a long list, I just listed three conditions or criteria. And practically, it's you know, up to you now to come up with all sorts of ideas, but make sure that you meet those criteria. And I think that's very important because we tend to speak about innovative in many ways and then no one defines it, what you, know, you actually really mean. And that's why I, I came up with that. So increase public spending on health equitably, 
and, uh, and go beyond traditional approaches to health financing. So I think what you are going to discuss meet those two criteria, hopefully. My challenge and test practically to this initiative is whether you will be able to fill coverage gaps. And that's why I brought forward those uh, the evidence that these coverage gaps exist. And of course, it's a question of values and preferences, whether you want to, you know, keep those coverage gaps and then, you know, just cater for those who are potentially more affluent anyway and, and, and can afford to pay a bit more. But uh, I think these criteria will help us to give a bit more, um, uh, uh, you know, constructive discussion to this otherwise very attractive terminology, innovation. Innovation always sounds that it, it must be good, right? But that's why I had to end with that note that if eventually that means more burden on patients and for households, that's not a not big innovation. We have seen that. But let me just say what I wanted to say, which is that... 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Yes. I'm coming from Barcelona. In Spain, in Catalonia, when the government introduced a new health plan, the president asked each and every minister to say what is it that they are going to do within their ministry in order to support the implementation of the health plan and how much they are going to contribute. Now that's, I think, innovation. Public, public, public funding for health and increasing that without having this endless dialogue of whether politicians will ever run on a ticket that increases taxes. Thank you. Strong closing message, uh, Tamás. And I think, you know, I see Vesna in the first row, and I think maybe she would have liked the list of hows. Um, but I think we, we talk about that maybe in a minute. We go to our audience now. I think before we come to you, Nicole, bear with me a second. Anyone from the audience here? Yep, we have Ricardo over there. So I'm coming to you. Thanks, Dimitri, and uh, great session, great moderation. Uh, it's, uh, it's really engaging. My name is Ricardo Leite. I'm a member of parliament from Portugal, uh, so fourth term. I was also a deputy mayor. I've done my share of election cycles. And um, I'm a medical doctor by training, and I run an, or an organization called Unite, which is a network of parliamentarians for global health present in more than 85 countries. So I've seen the politics around the world, and yes, it is true. Nobody wants to run on a platform saying we're going to tax you more. But it is possible to say that we should get McDonald's instead of sponsoring Olympics. They should be paying for our health system. And so it's really getting money from organizations that are taking away uh, health from our societies to fuel this. Another thing, OECD has really come up with the flat tax for uh, uh, multinational uh, companies that haven't been paying taxes or leaving all the money in Delaware in the U.S., uh, like Amazon and Facebook and so many companies that have, in a way, contributed to worse mental health. And so there are innovative ways to find the money. But that leads to the second issue, which is I saw political will in the cloud. In the cloud. I hear that every year. I've been coming here for a decade or so. Um, it's not about political. I don't know any minister of health that doesn't say, I want to do better in health. It's a question of political power. The minister normally is the last person in the room speaking in the cabinet, normally does not have the power to speak or to impose. It's always seen as the person bringing costs. To, to, the, to the cabinet and the government. And so it's really, and I think this is a really good study, because empirically, I think the observatory should look at this. Countries based on the hierarchy of the Minister of Health within the cabinet, and then the health outcomes. I assure you, the few cases in which the Prime Minister took health into, its, their, own, into their own uh, portfolio, health came out better at the end. The question, and I know you're already looking at me very severely. The question I have is very clearly, you know, we said we need more money for prevention, for digital. What we are seeing, though, is digital moving basically analogical procedures into digital procedures, but doing the same things. Prevention, we continue not to measure. Shouldn't we be standardizing 
value-based indicators so that we should all be measuring the same and then creating the carrots and sticks. And that should be the fuel for the moonshot of innovative financing so that when we put money in a system, it's not just saying we're putting money in a system, but it's actually delivering health and well-being for the people. Thank you, Ricardo. Anyone else with a question here who wants to follow this? Martin. Yes, okay. Very briefly, though. Very briefly, please. I, I just wanted to really echo that exactly. I, I would say, by the way, there are examples. We have an experiment going on where the new English health minister is also going to be the deputy prime minister, and I'll leave it at that. I think we'll watch and wait. But your point is exactly an important one. There are many organizations that pay virtually no tax. Starbucks are incredibly generous in the United Kingdom. They've been giving us coffee away for free for years because they make no money whatsoever. Yes, they've got a transfer pricing arrangement, so they pay huge amounts of money for the logo to their, their subsidiary. In, in the Netherlands. Uh, but that's where the money comes from. That's the innovative way of doing it. And then we need to look at countries like the United Kingdom that have the tax havens in the Caribbean and do something about that. And we need to do something about the corruption that goes with that. So we're just not prepared to do it. There are plenty of innovative things we could do. But I think I would disagree. I think the political will to deal with that is not there. Thank you very much, Martin. I think. We wrap up the audience participation on site because we won't have time for anything else. But these are really, really valid uh, points, of course. And I think they echo uh, a number of things that our speaker said and also what, what Natalie was talking about, the different initiatives of, of DG reform with, for example, health system performance assessment, if we think about value-based indicators and going in that direction or fighting corruption. We also heard about that. So it seems like we have things going on already, so we build on those, I would say. I'm not going to ask you to reflect on the questions because we have to take a summary from the online questions that we're also not going to reflect on right now because we're going to go to the second part. But please, Nicole, tell us what's been going on. Yeah, so um, the audience on site has already helped me because they've already made some of the questions that were already asked online as well. Um, so I don't need to repeat those. Uh, there's been a discussion going on on the role of waste and um, whether the speakers would like to share some best practice ex examples of, of how waste has been tackled um, in countries and whether there are any best practice examples of this. Um, and when it comes to government budgeting, how important investment in public health um, prevention is and whether investing in health determinants such as education um, and housing and improving social care can be as important as increasing investment in health care itself. Thank you very much. That reflects also Anka's point. So we're taking, we're keeping two points. One is waste and the other one is investing in the determinants of health for the discussion that will come later on. Because right now we're going to hear about the project that Natalie already hinted at um, together. Austria, Belgium and Slovenia came together um, to find new ways for uh, A, um, in, um, f um, I'm, for advocating for investing in health and B, for making the best possible use of the tools that are already available. So I would like to ask Vesna from the Slovenian Ministry of Health and Stefan from the Austrian Ministry of Health to come up and give us an overview of what the project is all about. Thank you very much for inviting us. I was not sure what I'm doing in this session, actually, because to me, money comes last, always, because I deal with all the challenges, you know, that are there uh, in our system, but also globally. Uh, and for me, it's very important to understand what the challenges are, or the needs of population, uh, again, uh, and then to actually figure it out uh, what needs to be done and how. And then comes money, because then, only then, uh, I have to figure it out how certain aspects need to be financed, because not everything needs to be financed, by the way. Sometimes we just need to change our ways of working. 
and uh, to, to even this session has a very nice uh, subtitle, the financial challenge of developing innovative health systems. So it's not about the money itself, it's about the challenge of developing innovative health systems and the financial aspect of it. So I will start here um, uh, and I will go back to 2019 when Slovenia was actually thinking of how we could, during our presidency to EU, best contribute to, the, to our common work in the EU in the area of health. And we said, well, we could choose mental health or something, you know, big deal things and have a great discussions about the values and I don't know what, or maybe we should find something, you know, that could be improved in our ways of working, the member states and the European Commission. And so we were discussing this with many other countries, we are members of Observatory of Health Systems. We use that platform. We sat around the table after the meetings and we said, well, what could be done better? And there it was. We in Slovenia, you could see from what was shown by, by Tamás, we are sitting in a wonderland. Well, it's not really truth. Uh, the money is not such a big deal problem because most of the time the problem is that we are not spending it right. And most of the time the problem is that we maybe don't have capacities, you know, that would spend that money that is available. So, and you know that there is plenty of money, uh, maybe not only nationally, but we have a lot of resources that we gather at the European Commission to be then used, you know, to support our reforms. And we were thinking of this and we said, well, um, why is it so difficult to us to go for this money? And there were several things that we uh, understood after discussing it. One thing was definitely that it doesn't happen like this, that Slovenia has an idea how to reform its system to make it work better, then we approach the Commission and we say, oh, fine, we have uh, these and these ideas how to improve, so where, I where are the resources now to help us? And we realize that first, we don't even know which resources are available. We just got the feeling that there are plenty uh, mechanisms there that could support us, not only with money, but also with technical support. And it, we understood that this confusion lasts so long that we change the government and there is a new idea then what we would do. So in these cycles, political cycles, we didn't really manage to, to use uh, the resources available for the right purpose. And then we said, this might be an issue that we want to discuss during our presidency. And we thought, okay, we'll see where we come. And we actually concluded that it would be great to change the ways of working with the Commission and us member states. So us member states should figure it out, why do we need support? That is really important, not to wait someone asking us or coming to us with some recommendations, you know, what we maybe should look at and try to change change, but us figuring out here is what we want to do. And then uh, based, of course, on the needs of population and everything that has been said before. And then turn to the Commission and say, this is what we want to do, so, so how can we do it best with the resources that are available? And it came out that we don't even know what mechanisms are there. So we turned to uh, observatory for health systems and policies and ask them to provide, uh, to, to actually make a document where these mechanisms will be listed for us member states to be, to have it really clear, you know, what is there to serve us. And during the presidency, we had really great support and understanding also within the commission. Commission was not actually mad at us because we wanted to, to change their ways of working. They were actually very happy. So they served us and they said, oh, great, you know, let's do something together. And then we concluded that we need to have an entry point so that they are not 
all the departments or directorates of the Commission where we should go and ask each directorate uh, and ask for support, but there would be one uh, uh, shop stop or however you call it, you know, and there we will get all the information available. But even when we understood that, you know, this is one of solutions, there were some other things that still were not okay, because the mechanisms, many of them, need them back home uh, to, to have a good understanding uh, of decision makers also, and there needs to be some structures in place that you can actually then go and use these mechanisms and support your reform. So that was another issue. And here uh, I will stop because then after our presidency we were very surprised because we were used that you know there's a presidency, you have these wonderful ideas, there are council conclusions, everything fine, and there needs a next presidency and wonderful ideas and it goes on and on. No, not this time. This time the commission actually decided to step in and offer us a possibility to make a pilot and test how this would work in reality. And now I will give the word to, the word to Stefan because he will explain a little bit more how we uh, are now um, having a project where we will try to test uh, this in reality. Thank you, Vesna, and thanks, colleagues, for, for the introduction because I think really it shows all the difficulties that we currently experience. So um, we heard this increasing pressure on our public health uh, budgets, but at the same time we have this growing demand uh, for services. And um, for, the, for the last two years, within the pandemic, we have identified the high priority to really strengthen our healthcare systems and to make them more resilient. But then, possibly, and, and that's the easiest answer, we are being told, but you know, it should be cheaper as well, or at least not too much more expensive. And, and I think that showed uh, the importance also of thinking outside the box and, and trying something new. And I, I guess sometimes in this question of innovation, we, we immediately have this thinking of innovation in a medical sector, in the, in the medical sector in our minds with um, um, technological innovation. And uh, in reality, sometimes I guess the real innovation is that we apply the, um, the, the evidence that we know is out there and make it happen. And this is more the kind of innovation that we try to foster with our um, project. And yeah, allow me to share a first glimpse about this uh, project that we have initiated. And the topic of this year's Gastein Forum is a moonshot for a true European health union, if not now, then when. And well, if you look to the dictionary, maybe that's an, an advantage not being a native, just in case, look to the dictionary, right? You will find two meanings. One is quite obvious. It's, it's the act of sending a spacecraft to the moon. And, and the other one is a plan or aim to do something that seems almost impossible. And jointly with our partners from Belgium, who unfortunately cannot be here, um, and Slovenia, uh, we believe that a plan to do something that seems almost impossible should start with a very concrete and hands-on action to prove that actually it is possible. And, and we're really excited uh, that the Commission decided in the end um, to not only take the courage to support uh, that project, but also to share the same vision to aim high, in, in, in fact to aim really high, and I will come to that a bit later. Uh, Commissioner Kirikidis today in the plenary said, um, for EU health union we need both. Uh, we need to be ambitious and to be pragmatic, and I think that's also characterizing this uh, um, approach that we are following. And we have to prove benefits, and given the time we have to be quick in proving benefits. Um, with the strong support of the, of the European Commission, and in particular this hands-on uh, mentality of, of teacher reform that we were um, now experiencing in a couple of projects within the health sector, um, I think we are really um, in a position to quickly show that benefits are possible and to demonstrate that we can achieve more by collaborating. So the question was the moonshot, if not now, uh, when? And I think I would like to add, if, how can we achieve that? And going into the how. So finally, um, what we have established with, with, with the projects uh, with the project are 
two work streams, and I would like to come back to the slider that we saw earlier with the question of, of new funds versus optimizing, and I think it was 50% for optimizing and 40% of, of more funds. And we are aware that, that both dimensions are essential if we talk about investment in health. So our ver first work stream in our project um, is exactly to make the case for public investment in health, but also to making sure that we optimally use the funds. And now you will say that's not a new topic, that's not innovative at all. And I, I fully agree, but um, what we feel is that sometimes um, we don't use what is out there most efficiently, uh, and we struggle in applying it. Sometimes the struggle lies in the communication. Um, we heard that a couple of times. Um, sometimes you feel we speak different languages in finance as in health. Uh, and sometimes um, it's also that we uh, don't believe that we use the methods also to making sure our um, uh, funds are used as efficient as possible. And we need to look into that topic. And I think it was quite, quite clear also from the audience that we need to follow that. But the second work stream is something that is fundamentally different and that is new. And that's, the, the, that's our moonshot. It's the establishment of an EU health resource hub. Um, and the EU health resource hub should exactly um, address this challenge that I think also uh, was, was mentioned before. We have a lot of funding out there on the European level um, and obviously also on national levels. But we see with this increasing pressure on budgets, we need to be a bit more innovative in approaching those uh, fundings. Uh, we have an EU health program that is bigger as it was before. Um, but then again, it's not directly applicable, typically, for investments in health systems. Uh, and we see that many other funds exist that we can use, but we typically don't use because we don't know exactly what is out there, how to use it. So uh, we had the, the uh, earlier structure funds, we had InvestEU, we have Digital Europe, we had the Connecting Europe facility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, only to have an overview wasn't that easy, and I think it was great that within the Slovenian presidency it was possible to um, create some, some first mappings. Based on, on our personal experience in Austria, also my personal experience in trying to navigate in this cosmos, and, and there is a, a short information also in this year's EuroHealth about that, um, sometimes one can get the impression of navigating the seven seas during the night following the stars. I think that was also in the previous session, Francesca, where you were aligning the stars, right? And sometimes one gets this impression. And uh, we want to overcome that by enhancing the capacities within the uh, public institutions, but also to have um, someone giving direct, direct technical support in doing so. So this hub is really the one-stop shop we think is crucial, that we don't need to do to reinvent the um, application processes and the way to those funding possibilities again and again. And it will really contribute to the strengthening, the overall strengthening of the healthcare system. Um, the hub provides and, and shall provide consultant, consultation services uh, for which EU funding mechanisms uh, one could apply for given on the demand, but also provide hands-on support for making the application. Because typically we are not good in that in, in, in the health system. And I think we need to get better, but we also could use synergies there. Um, again, we follow the approach, ambition, and pragmatism. So we, we want and we need to think big, but we also need to act quickly. So we will test the EU health resource up with three pilots, uh, the development of integrated care, including mental health and prevention, strengthening of primary health care with a focus on digitalization, and greening of our health system. That's the starting point to see what the hub can do for the three member states. But as Natalie pointed out, we want to think bigger. We want to make it available to all member states. And I think Natalie also pointed out to maybe use it for other sectors. But that was the first glimpse. We are, we are really uh, excited to have uh, that project now uh, being kicked off and think it can be, it can add to the puzzle and to the, uh, it can be an important element um, towards uh, EU Health Union. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan. <laughs> Applause for Vesna and Stefan for, for presenting the project for us. What strikes me now is that I think we had a question earlier, should it be national level or EU level? We had the dichotomy of better allocation of existing funds and additional funds. And my feeling is your project sort of hits of all of that. 
uh, together. So basically you're going to look at how we can strengthen the national level, how we can use what we have in terms of tools at the, at the national level, but also the one-stop shop for the EU contribution. One of your pilots is about prevention, among other things. It's about strengthening primary health care, all of that going in the direction of the innovative, resilient health systems. So it, it, I think it's a, from my, from my view, I'm also biased, of course, but uh, it's a very, very promising, promising initiative. I, I would like to give the word to our panelists to reflect on what you've heard about the project. Natalie, perhaps the first point should go to you. You already introduced us a little bit, but I think give us the DG reform side of this. Well, thank you and many thanks to, to Vesna and Stefan for having presented their experience in this. I think what is key there is the leadership that has been evidenced by uh, the uh, Slovenian, Austrian and Belgian colleagues and uh, the, the vision of the Slovenian presidency. Uh, who um, got the council to adopt council conclusions, inviting the commission to indeed uh, launch an initiative and a project to uh, facilitate access to the various funds that are available in the area of, of health. So there you see, as, as Vesna was saying it, actually it looks like money in itself is not really the issue. The issue is how to make the best, the most intelligent and efficient use of the available funds and the available money. We have a lot of funds in the European Union. We have an issue regarding the absorption of funds and many member states have a difficulty to maximize the absorption of funds. And I'm not even talking about the issue of uh, the risk of corruption, etc., which is something that we also tackle, and we also tackle in the context of the Recovery and Resilience Plan. But here, I also think what is fantastic is to see that we have three member states who have decided to go together on this adventure uh, with the European Commission and, and DG Reform, and I would really like to thank them for their trust. Thank you for your trust that deeply honors us. It's a great privilege to be, to be working with you. Um, it is also great and uh, visionary and pioneering because you are with us doing the hard work to start something that maybe then will be used by others. So they will reap the benefits from all your thinking, your vision, your pioneering uh, uh, experience, etc. But that, that's how it is. You know, you only need, always need to have mothers and fathers of projects uh, for uh, everyone to be able to benefit from it. But this is a fantastic project. Uh, for us, DG Reform, it's the most important one this year. Uh, in the area of health, absolutely no doubt about this, and maybe even looking at the rest of our activity. Uh, we are going to devote all our energy to that, and we really hope that uh, we will have something that will be a game changer, actually, for fueling the health system moonshot. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much also for linking to the, to the moonshot. I, I come to Anka, who has a, a, a question and a comment, and then we go to Tamash and we close with Francesca on the first reactions to the project, if you have them. Thank you. Um, I noted the first comment that Vesna made, which is that it all started with an exercise of figuring out what the needs were. And... Uh, that is just so important. So my follow-up question to that is, is there part of this consultative process and part of this um, project, uh, is there a space for co-creation and consultation with the users of the healthcare systems, which are citizens and in the more intensive part of it, the patients? Uh, because I would see value in that as well. If you start with the needs and with how to get things done, 
uh, it's already very innovative to start with the needs and then think about the money rather than start, oh, we have this, what can we do with it? So, so uh, that logical process already, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an innovation to me. Um, is there a space in your project to consult with patients, with users of healthcare, with occasional users of healthcare? And a direct response from Besna. Yes, please. Okay, look, uh, we put it digitalization of primary health care as a part of the project where we will try to check how this could be best financed with different mechanisms and how actually also we could advocate to our finance ministry that is worth investing in this project, so the both sides. How could we imagine, you know, we have spent a lot of money in de digitalization in health sector already. I think every country has invested a lot of money already to digitalize. And in most cases, it has been done in a way, you know, that there were um, a lot of digital solutions, you know, but nobody was really taking care of asking those people, it's not just about the patient, it's also about the doctors and the nurses that are then using um, these uh, so digital solutions, you know. Uh, we were thinking of, you know, how to best collect the data that needs to be collected and, you know, send this data wherever needs to be analyzed and so on, and that was that digital part. Um, and we didn't really consider how much work, additional work will this represent for the workforce and how much this will affect actually the patient that is visiting a doctor. You know, that was done, I mean, that was, these were the mistakes before. So definitely it wouldn't be okay if we would repeat this kind of uh, mistakes, you know. So uh, yes, I agree with you, whatever we will do, we will have to involve not only the patients, the users, the end users, but also the workforce that deals with, um, that will benefit, that should benefit actually from uh, digital support and not just be overburdened uh, by innovative solu digital solutions. Thank you, Vesna. A whole session about that separately. Uh, Stefan, any reactions or we move? Okay, yes, quick one, please. Yeah, but very quick. I think really the difference is this demand-driven approach where we then can take our national priorities that typically, and I fully agree, we, we need to look what where is the real demand and not start with, ah, actually there is a possible funding instrument. Let's see what we can use. And to be honest, sometimes the reality is, is the other way around. So I think also with, with following that approach, that should help a lot already. Thank you, and that's also an honest insight, Stefan. So thank you very much for that. Tomás, you're already holding the microphone, so I'm coming to you. Go ahead. So definitely this is an example of thinking outside the box, coming up with innovative ideas, innovative approaches. Uh, no wonder, actually, that it's Austria and Slovenia and Belgium. I don't know if you paid careful attention to the evidence I showed. They are the best performing countries. So usually what we see is that they are the ones who are really after, okay, more challenges and innovation. So that's great. It's great that the EU is there to support that. And just as Vesna started, look at what the system is need, what the system needs what are the challenges that you need to fix you have fixed quite a lot of the challenges but you still have some challenges in the box some waste right if not financial hardship or unmet need but waste for sure i think what's going to be critical is to have a proper monitoring system of the impact because the cycle ends with exactly that again whether this leads to better performance and whether eventually those who are not the leaders in innovation will come forward and also the EU will be able to support them with the same approach, not reinventing some other wheels that are not running as well as the, as the wheel that you have come up. I think we raised expectations, right, towards Austria and, and Slovenia and, and Belgium now to show that they are using this innovative approach. I think the intention was to make colleagues aware, but now, of course, the expectations are really, really high, so the pressure is on. Um, Francesca. Okay. 
does not seem, okay, now it works, yeah. Just to raise even a little bit more the expectation. Um, you mentioned your rights that, you know, we discuss financing, but it's financing of innovative health systems. So for me, there are at least two issues that would be really, really important to look at. And it has to do with rigidities in the health systems. One is the health workforce. If you look at labor markets more broadly, the health labor markets is much more rigid than what you see in other, you know, labor markets, whether it's um, in, uh, in the way the definition of the roles of doctors and nurses, which is very, very uh, well defined, uh, you know, the, the way you, you finance the, the health professionals, uh, um, the, the qualification processes, it's all of this made obviously for good reasons, for quality, but it has created a very rigid system. Through the COVID, we have seen lots of innovations, and I wonder whether you could also like try to look through, again, the, the financing of innovative health system in terms of breaking down these uh, rigidities. The second one has to do with digital transformations um, that, again, COVID-19 has seen a push to have uh, a much more innovative uh, system in terms of the use of the data, having real-time data and information, a bit more efforts in linking data sets as well, more telemedicine and telehealth. And so, again, whether we could look at those, uh, um, you know, breaking down of those rigidities um, in a way that also assess the value for, for, for patients as well. Thank you very much, Francesca. Reactions from Vesna and, and Stefan on yes, the points we heard? Um, Sorry. Yeah. Very shortly. I mean, uh, Francesca, what you just said is actually the same thing. You know, it's uh, uh, whether you look to uh, how uh, we uh, use the possibilities of digitalization or the, as you uh, called it, it's rigidity, was it, uh, of, um, of the health workforce. I mean, it's we had, uh, you know, our health systems as granted, but then with all these new challenges and opportunities actually, because the digitalization should be seen as opportunity, but very often is a challenge also. So, you know, all this has happened in so short time that I think we have, a, we had a difficulty to respond appropriately uh, because um, the workforce, uh, for example, did, um, react to the crisis of COVID uh, because there's so much uh, enthusiasm, you know, in, in the workforce, in the health workforce. So it's not just them leaving. Some did leave because it was too much anyway. But, you know, we would need to, we would need to consider the ways, you know, how to better spend the time of the workforce that is there and that is really precious. precious. For example, in Slovenia, doctors, they spend and studying uh, and uh, in training 12 years. So uh, yes, there is little flexibility here, you know, but there is also possibility of, um, uh, of you know, um, uh, deciding that some of the, uh, of the services could be done by other professionals. And th there are plenty of good examples where this has been done, for example, in diabetes care and so on, you know. So we have to explore here, but whatever we are going to do and look for some innovative solutions, there needs to be some investments. And what I'm saying is not, it's not always the investment of money, it's investment of resources available to innovate also. We forget, you know, that there are so few people who can spend their time to look for the solutions. You know, in our administration in particular, there are not even the right people seated there. You know, then we have public health institute, they are trying hard, you know, and here I think it's so important to understand that for small countries in particular, like mine and perhaps even Austria here, is important that we use the international capacity much better. And here we have WHO, and here we have Commission, and here we have also representatives of non-governmental sector that could step in and we could all together try to use this, these resources much better to innovate and at the end, you know, to systemize the innovation that will be successful. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Vesna. And I think this was the perfect concluding sentence for the session. Stefan, I don't know if you want to add something, but for me, this was basically the gist of the entire hour and a half that we were sitting here. So thank you very much. I'm not going to add to that. I don't dare. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us, for your insights. Thank you very much to Austria, Slovenia, and Belgium for in, in, in initiating the project. And I think next year we're going to hear about how it's going. Yeah? Thank you all very much. Thank you for staying to our audience. Don't leave yet. And before my Gastein colleagues kill me, don't forget to evaluate the session. It's very important. And evaluate it as it deserves really well. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the evening.